as a as a business matures, the opposite needs to happen, right? You need to have more more specialists who have a fairly narrow range of expertise, but it goes really deep so they can scale, right? If they're in sales, they've run a large scale organization. If they're in operations, they've run high volume, you know, manufacturing distribution. So they tend the the people that succeed at larger companies that are more mature, slower growth, they have a skill set that is narrower and much deeper, right? Than than the startup folks who have much shallower level of, of expertise, but they're broad. They can do four, five, six things, right? And then emotionally, the tolerance for risk tends to be almost almost reciprocal. Welcome back to another episode of the Todd Durkin Impact Show. And today we are joined by one of my best friends, a man that I've known since 2006. That's right, 2006 when he came into my life and we have become uh, best of friends. And he's someone who's close to my family. He's been a business friend and mentor. He's been a personal friend and someone who has impacted the fitness industry more than most. He is none other than Randy Hetrick, the founder and creator of the TRX. Yeah, those black and yellow straps that everyone has used. Yep, and has uh, generated over $100 million in revenue. Today, we're going to be talking about the TRX, his new spinoff called Outfit Training, OutfitTraining.com, and uh, what he's doing with Outfit Training. Now, Randy served 14 years as a Navy SEAL, 14 years as a Navy SEAL, including the legendary SEAL Team 6. My friends, that's a long time as a Navy SEAL. And in today's show, we talk about the lessons he he learned as a SEAL and how he applied that into the TRX world, as well as now out the training. And even today, we're going to talk a little politics. Yeah, TD normally doesn't go to the politics side, but today I got Randy on the show and we're going to talk some politics. A little backstory. Check this out. February 2006, my client at the time, Drew Brees, had just blown his shoulder out of his socket. Dr. James Andrews, yep, the iconic physician down in Birmingham, Alabama, reconstructs Drew's surgery. And he and Kevin Wilk, the physical therapist that works with Dr. James Andrews, they are in San Diego at a physical therapy conference downtown San Diego. And I wanted to go listen to them talk because I had a lot of work to do on Drew's shoulder if he was going to come back in the fall of 2006 to play a football season. So I go down there. And when Dr. Andrews and Kevin Wilk were done speaking, it was about 1.45 in the afternoon on a Saturday. I still remember it. And there was 15 minutes left for me to sneak into the fitness Industry for the sh into the show, so I could see the actual all of the different vendors who had their equipment. I looked into the into the the showroom and I see these black and yellow straps I had never seen before. And I had one shot. I went over there and I meet this guy named Randy Hetrick. And Randy, who created the TRX, goes on to tell me about this new system that he founded when he was a Navy SEAL and that it's going to revolutionize fitness and uh, that millions of people are going to use it. And no one even knew what it was. But Randy and I hit it off and I got the it factor real fast. I actually bought my first pair of TRX straps that day in February 2006 because I knew that it would be a very important part to Drew's recovery. Well, lo and behold, uh, now, many years later, uh, Randy and I've worked closely together on many different projects and, and through TRX and now Outfit and at Fitness Quest 10 and in speaking and everything else, Randy has done amazing things and he has influenced our fitness industry uh, more than most. And let me tell you what, he is one special human being. He's a great dad. He's a great, he's a great man. He's a great friend and uh, someone I can't wait to highlight on today's show. So today, be prepared for a exclusive interview with the man, the myth, and the legend, Randy Hetrick. Hey, I know y'all are fired up to hear Randy Hetrick speak today. I welcome the new family member in last week. I told you about my new friends, Bubs Naturals. I've been using them for three years. Yeah, I've been using them for three years. But they just said, TD, we got to power the show. 
We got to be part of the movement, the impact movement. I said, you better believe it, Bug Naturals. Welcome to the family. My friends, today, just like last week, if you have not listened to it yet, make sure you go back and listen to the episode last week. You got to check it out. But we've got Bug Naturals in the house, 20% off for any of my loyal listeners. If you are a listener of the Todd Impact Show and you would like 20% off any of their products, I use them all. Collagen protein, MCT oil powder, and the new apple cider vinegar. Yeah, 20% off when you go to the code IMPACT. Put in the code IMPACT, I-M-P-A-C-T. Todd Durkin, IMPACT show. Put in IMPACT, you get 20% off. My friends, collagen protein has to be part of your arsenal. Whether you put them in your protein shakes, if you drink coffee, put the collagen protein in. I do a scoop and a half, okay? I do a scoop and a half. Always got to get the extra half in there. The MCT oil powder, get the scoop of MCT oil powder. It tastes great when you do that in your shakes or in your coffees. And the new apple cider vinegar, great for gut health as well. My friends, check it out today. Go to bubsnaturals.com, bubsnaturals.com, 20% off. The code is IMPACT. And uh, welcome to the family. Without further ado, let's go out to the show now and hear from the one and the only former Navy SEAL, Randy Hetrick. I am so pumped up today. I got my man, Randy Hetrick in the house. Randy, what's happening? TD, it's always so good to be together. You know, if we got to do it virtually, I'll take it. Matter of fact, most of you are listening right now, but Randy is sitting. Where are you sitting? I see a bunch of TRX gear in the background, outfit gear. Where are you sitting? Well, I am up over the top of my uh, garage in my in my sort of Rapunzel's tower, if you will, of, of pandemic, you know, homework environment, and um, it kind of doubles as a as the TRX uh, VIP sports marketing department as well and has throughout the pandemic. So I kept a, you know, I kept a good amount of, of stuff here so that we could uh, send out, you know, love kits to all the special folks that help us along the way. And that's moi. Uh, I'm the shipper. So. Uh, and you're holding a, a cup. What is that tea? I want to read that coffee because, or whatever that oh. cup says, what is that? Oh yeah. Well, it is it is matcha tea and and as you can see here you know this is the perfect cup it says or, i can't be held responsible for what my face does when you talk because every time i'm talking randy's making these crazy faces like you're all right now as you're out for your walk jog run you're lifting weights you're on the trx straps and you're getting after it and you're making cray cray faces like randy is right now as he drinks his what's it matcha tea yeah i'm trying to i'm trying to do some stuff that's healthier than just more coffee I can't even I can't even say matcha tea without making a crazy face. So good, good. It is so good to see you, brother. Nice to see you, my man. Yeah, that that cup is the perfect uh, Zoom work environment cup because I'm sure I'm not the only one that ends up on an endless series mm. of Zoom calls. And you know, sometimes your face reveals uh, w w what's going on behind it. Folks, as I shared earlier in the intro, I met Randy 2006. And uh, here we are now, 2021, many moons later. And uh, Randy, can you just bring us up the snuff? Uh, TRX, where, where are we at TRX? Where's Randy Hedrick? This is going to be an episode, folks, like you you feel like you're sitting in the loft with us as Randy's up in the loft. <laughs> I, I wouldn't call it the TRX showroom, but uh, Randy, bring me up the snuff. How's life going? Where are you at these days in the midst of the pandemic? Yeah, man, it's going it's going well, uh, relatively speaking. And by that, I mean, I think there are a lot of folks that have uh, suffered way, way, way more uh, than I certainly have during this uh, pan extended pandemic. And, you know, TRX uh, in part of the business was, was really challenged, right? As you and I have talked before, the, the, the gym supply side and the athletic training supply side been under a lot of pressure, but the consumer side benefited. So, you know, all in all, we ended up really being what I would say is a sort of pandemic resistant. I don't think anybody's pandemic proof, but you know, mm -hmm. pandemic resistant business because five or six years ago, when we really started to focus on on adding consumer uh, to our consumer fitness to our our um, our customer base, that was very helpful, right? And so, so I would say, you know, we we fared it pretty well. Um, and then there've been some opportunities that 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 really leapt to the fore during this 
challenging time frame. And, you know, I hope we'll have a little chance to talk about that because as, as some might know who, who maybe follow me or TRX, I spun out a new startup called Outfit, which aims to take all of the stuff that TRX has done for a couple of decades in gyms and in athletic training facilities, put it in these super tricked out sprinter vans, right? All controlled by, by really what is rapidly becoming a world-class tech platform. And then take that TR experience out into the neighborhoods all across the country, right? Because there's still between 80 and 90% of the population that doesn't belong to gyms. And so I looked at that opportunity and said, well, hell, we got a pandemic kicking our butts. You know, our gym, our gym side of our business is, uh, is at least under pressure, if not, you know, really taking it the shorts. And there's an opportunity out there to, uh, to take fitness in an, into a new context that is, you know, relatively uh, virus safe and um, and frankly, it's just a new kind of blue ocean opportunity rather than just piling in with another brick and mortar studio or, you know, someplace where there's already plenty of good service providers. And Randy, I do want to talk about outfit today. I want to talk about even some of the, your lessons uh, as a Navy SEAL and what would Randy Hetrick do uh, if you were leading the Afghanistan whole mission. I, I don't go there yet. I do oh want to today because I, I want a Navy SEAL perspective on what the heck's going on over there and uh, how the SEAL community feels about everything. And folks, you know, I don't usually go there, but I'm going there today with my with my man. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to get about that and then also uh, just about life as well. But let's start with the TRX side of things. What vertical within TRX has gone well in the last year and a half? Is it the, is it the straps? Obviously, those of you who know the TRX brand, um, there's the TRX training uh, centers up in San Fran. You've got a whole technology play at TRX. What verticals have worked the best in the last couple of years? Well, it's for sure been the consumer fitness channel, right? Because um, actually, I, I, you and I haven't had a chance to talk about this, but we actually shut down the TRX training center along with our headquarters building when we, you know, our, our lease was up. The pandemic was was shut down, had just happened, and we had to make a decision. And so, so my uh, my new partners and I made a decision to, you know, kind of try the virtual the virtual environment because we knew it was going to be kind of a butt kicker for brick and mortar studios. And um, you know, so rather than, and we knew we were all going to be home. And so it was one of those weird things that everything kind of lined up, and we said, well, you know what, we're always trying to innovate. Let's see if we can innovate our our business model. And, and be a virtual uh, headquarters, if you will, which is challenging when you weren't built that way, right? When you were built as a, everybody's together, right. it's, it's a little different without fit. I'm building that as a virtual company, um, but, but TRX was built as a headquartered epicenter. And so, you know, that's been, that's been challenging, I would say. Um, and the commercial side of the business Obviously, with all the studios and gyms, um, you know, shut down and under pressure, that was a challenging piece of the business. So we've we've really focused a lot on consumer, and we've leaned hard into the development of our digital, you know, content delivery. We have a we launched a TRX Training Club, which is kind of I guess I would describe it as our version of a Peloton like service, right? And um, that's been uh, that's been a big lift, but really exciting, and you know it's now up and running and growing quite rapidly. So that I think that's going to be a big part of our business. So the first few months of the pandemic, as most of you know, if you were outfitting your your homes, you were looking for kettlebells, you were looking for medicine balls, you were looking for dumbbell anything, and I'm sure the black and yellow straps were part of the arsenal in most of your homes as well. Uh, at any point during that time, did you just like sell out of straps? Like, oh my gosh, we're out of supply. Oh, dude, we, we were out of stock a third of the year. Yeah, I mean, wow. you know, we had a we had a huge 2020, and it would have been even more massive, except we were, you know, if you out were completely out of stock. <laughs> we sold out of everything. We sold out of everything we made from, you know, kettlebells to mm. plyo boxes, ropes, bands, sticks, straps, y you name it, we sold out of it. And, uh, and especially the suspension trainers, right? Because they were, they were sort of everybody's go-to who had, 
has trained at a at a you know TRX class in their gym and suddenly found themselves booted out the the front door. Well, they they pivoted and went to Dick Sporting Goods. They went to Amazon. They went to our website and um, yeah, bought us out of out of everything we had. And so that was a high quality problem, but it was a real problem, right? Because when your when your revenues suddenly go to zero, it doesn't matter why. Like you ran out of stock, you're still not selling anything. And and so that was a real challenge all year long with the supply chains coming out of China and you know and even the Dominican Republic places where we manufacture our stuff were were came to a, a grinding halt and developed these huge backlogs which they're still trying to dig out of honestly they're still you know we we still are uh, finding finding it difficult to get rubber you know so so our strength you know we just launched the bandits which which uh, were the product of um, of a bit of tinkering on in my garage and were sold out of all that stuff. I mean, now we've got it back in stock, but it's it's still a battle because supply chains are so far behind. Mm-hmm. And and how in this process did your new spinoff occur? Outfit is it was this something that you were thinking of prior to the pandemic, or did the pandemic? allow you to go deep in your garage or in the loft there and, and you started thinking about, hey, where is the industry going? Tell me about that process, the transition. It was kind of see all of the above. It was, so so you will remember, because you and I have been together on these journeys long enough, you will remember back in the day when we had that tricked out Sprinter van called TRX on tour. I, right? I, we had it here at Business Quest 10 multiple times for the Impact Foundation. Exactly. So we we ran that thing for a couple of years, right around the, around the country. Yeah. We used our master trainers. They they'd say, yeah, I'll take them a month, and they'd pair up and they'd go on like these. It was basically like you know Bill and Ted's wild adventure, <laughs> and and they would just travel around doing TRX classes for partners like you. You know, if somebody had a new gym that was opening, we'd roll out and and show out in the parking lot like what was going to be happening once the gym was open. We did different events, the OP Pro, those kinds of things. It was a, it was a brand activation, right? And the funny thing about it, this was like ten years ago, eleven years ago, pre social media, pre geolocation, right? So all these technologies didn't exist then, and and so while we would deliver these incredible experiences, the challenge was logistics. And after a couple of years, you know, my marketers were basically saying, "Boss, please." Can we do something else? This is killing us. And and the wheels were falling off the thing. And so we decided, all right, let's shelf that. And we moved that thing down to Ontario and it became like a, uh, you know, a kind of a runaround van. And, and the, um, the thing that stuck in my head though, was all these experiences where when we would deliver them, we'd have trainers come up to us afterward and go, Hey, are you going to franchise this? Because, you know, I'm interested. And we have gym members, just regular folks come up and be like, how do I join this? This is so awesome. So every couple of years, I would kind of, I had this deck and I would take it out and I'd kind of, you know, tinker with the slides and I'd, I'd update it a little bit. And I kept thinking about it, thinking about it. And, you know, you're always making these decisions. Hey, do we expand the TRX training center? But the TRX Training Center was a brick and mortar studio. We had one of them in San Francisco that had developed as our our lab, right? And it it got packed. I mean, it ended up being really successful. Yeah. But but the challenge was, I was like, I don't you know. There's no shortage of brick and mortar facilities. All those folks are my partners. You know, they're the folks that we help that help build TRX. I don't really want to go and compete with them. And so. So we ultimately decided not to expand that business for the, for those reasons, right? There was enough enough out there, and we didn't want to compete with the folks that brung us. But I had in my mind this this mobile opportunity, and then along came Uber, along comes social media, right? All of a sudden, these technologies that didn't exist before come into being, and so literally, when I recapitalized the business with with my new uh, capital partners. You know, one of the things we did is we sat down and I said, look, I've been running this thing for a long time. You know, I've got it, you know, well on its way to, toward uh, when we when we first had this conversation toward, you know, 100 million bucks in revenue. And um, 
I really am a startup guy. Like I'm a guy that likes to sort of take a concept, think it through, you know, vet it, and then bring it to life by building a team and doing the things that, you know, I mean, there's not that many, starting something is pretty challenging as, as you know, and running a large organization is very challenging. And they take kind of two separate skill sets, right? The, the guy or gal that's equipped to run a billion dollar organization is almost by definition, the antithesis of, a, of the right person to start something. And, and conversely, you know, as a startup person, you have a unique set of skills and foolishness that, that you know, enables you to do it. And, and that almost by definition means that you're probably not equipped to run a billion dollar venture. They're different skill sets. One's much more of a manager and the other is more of a, you know, you know of a, uh, a, I don't know what to call it, a foolish visionary and an early team builder, right? And, and so one is, I think, more of in my strengths, which is more of a leader. The other is more of a manager. Yeah. And, you know, you have to have a little leadership there as well, but but it's they're just different cats. And so I made this sort of, uh, deal with my new partners. I said, look, I'll I'll stick around in this for another year in terms of running the day to day. But by that point, you know, I want to have found sort of the person who is equipped to take TRX from say a hundred million to five hundred million. And you know, I've got an idea to go start something new that's going to add a ton of value to the brand, right? But it'll be done separately, and it's really something I'm super passionate about. And I want to do. And so fortunately, my partner, Brent, said, you know, all right, let's do it. And, uh, and so that's what we did. So it was, a, it was coming before the pandemic, a long way to answer your short question. It was, it was inspired way before the pandemic. But then when the pandemic hit, I said, well, all right, if, I was, if I'm ever doing this, now is the moment. And so, uh, you know, about halfway through 2020, I cobbled together a team of, uh, of cats from the industry. Fortunately, there were a lot of folks that were uh, available, right? A lot of good folks that were available who had been pandemic out of their longtime industry positions. And one of those was Jeff Rosga from uh, Lifetime Fitness. Jeff had been, you know, an exec there for 20 years in in personal and group tra- group fitness, Lifetime Academy. And um, you know, I I happened to be talking to him about about uh really he was looking at new opportunities and i said hey let me pitch one at you that you might not have thought of you know i know you're a big company guy but maybe maybe i can convince you that you ought to be a startup guy and uh and lo and behold he said well that sounds interesting and so we built a team and launched uh took us really the better part of a year you know to to be ready to launch and we launched in uh i guess april 1st that's a that's a funny day to launch a company i guess so you're you're now in the middle of this transition then yeah i mean i've i've largely transitioned out of the day-to-day i mean i'm not completely out of the day-to-day with trx i'm still sort of the lead product you know developer um i'm obviously the a, a uh you know, a forever brand ambassador, uh, and and I, you know, I sit on the board, and I'm an, I'm very involved. But I just, I mean, that organization takes a lot to run it, and particularly the things that were, you know, the new initiatives that we're bringing to market. Um, it's it's impossible to do that and start something else at the same time. It's interesting, Randy, when you talk about that leadership and a startup guy. I remember hearing the founder of Infusionsoft speak a couple of years ago and he talked about if you're a founder of a company you take it from zero to whatever level it's at but if you take it to let's say a hundred thousand dollars or even a million dollars a leader can typically take a company two different levels and he out he outlined different levels of a company so the person that can get it to the million dollars may not be able to get it to the 10 million the person who get to the 10 million I can't get it to the hundred million or beyond. So if you've been quote stuck at the hundred million dollar mark, yes, it, it could potentially require a new leadership team or person persons to help propel it to that quote billion dollar level as well. And that stuck in my head thinking, hey, how can I even reorganize Fitness Quest 10 at that time? This was a couple of years ago 
to, hey, we've been getting, generating the same revenue, this was all pre-pandemic. How do I take it to the next level? How can I reorganize the, the leadership team? And that's when I brought in Jeff Bristol and, and delegated Julie to the TV side of things. And even what we're doing now with some of the current changes, a la like yourself, to say, how do we position ourselves for, for maximum growth? That struck a chord with me of like looking at the opportunities to reallocate and reorganize uh, to put yourself in that, in that same mentality. And I love what you said there about you know, you're an owner, you're an owner, but you're also the founder, creator, and you love to create things. So that's why Outfit was created because of your desire to get back into what you love to do. Yeah, you know, I think, I think it's different. Um, there are different skill sets for sure. And also different kind of emotional compositions, different tolerances, right? Startup cats tend to be very, um, very much more generalists, right? Because when you think about it, you're starting a business, you don't have much and you don't have many people. And so everybody's got to wear multiple hats, which means that everybody kind of needs to be a mile wide and a, you know, an inch deep. As a, as a business matures, the opposite needs to happen, right? You need to have more, more specialists who have the fairly narrow range of expertise, but it goes really deep so they can scale Right. If they're in sales, they've run a large scale organization. If they're in operations, they've run high volume, you know, manufacturing distribution. So they tend the the people that succeed at larger companies that are more mature, slower growth, they have a skill set that is narrower and much deeper, right? Than than the startup folks who have much shallower level of, of expertise, but they're broad. They can do four, five, six things, right? And then emotionally, the tolerance for risk tends to be almost, almost reciprocal, right? So the, the people who like to work at big, steady companies, man, they don't like risk. They like certainty, stability, right? All the things that make a guy like me go crazy. I feel like I'm going to climb out of my skin, you know? I want to be down in the trenches sort of figuring out, solving problems, and, and knocking down walls, and I get turned on mm-hmm. by, which sounds a little weird, right? But by, by that risk, by that, that sort of early, I, I, I despise bureaucracy, TD. I just can't, I can't abide it, right? And so, and I have no patience for it. Right, well, that right. almost by definition makes me a crappy big company manager because it's all about bureaucracy and process and, you know, and, and so it's not right, wrong. It's just different. It's like apples and bananas, you know, taking a company to a hundred million dollars, Randy, isn't no uh, small, small fries. So you, you've done good kid. You've done good. Well, yeah. So outfit, I mean, it's so funny because I, my friend, I mean, I know you've said this to me when we've been chatting all my friends who, who know me well, you know, when I, when I'm talking about outfit, they'll say like, dude, I just, I, you're infectious. Like you're, you know, I feel the energy and I feel the excitement and that's because that's what turns me on, right? That's what makes me tick. Yep. And, and whereas like, if you would have talked to me a few years ago, you know, man, like I was really just getting tired. You know, and is that when we had that dinner conversation in Toronto at Can Fit Pro and that, yeah. that's what I remember that conversation was about three hours long. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. It's just, you know, tired and just tired of the BS of that, that, you know, is, is an inevitable part of running a big, big organization and the politics and all that crap, right? It's just not, it's just not really my gig. And so outfit, when I decided to do this and, you know, and I am, I'm grateful for my partners at TRX saying, you know, seeing the vision and saying, okay, I understand how, you know, you're going to go do this separately with different different investors, different everything. But I understand how this is going to help drive TRX because everything we're doing in Outfit is TRX, right? The gear, the, the programming, uh, philosophy, all of it. Um, but it's a very different kind of business. And, and we couldn't have done it inside. You know, people have asked me that. Well, why didn't you do it inside TRX? It's just, it's too difficult to... You know, we've got we have a huge emphasis going on with the TRX training club at TRX, right? Building this big digital platform and we're doing 
two because we're doing one for the consumer and we're also doing one for trainers. So that's a huge lift and it takes a ton of resources and focus and energy to do well along with all of the products at TRX, right? And so trying to then layer on a service business that is around, you know, a mobile, I mean, basically a mobile gym business. It, it just wouldn't have been the right thing to do. Um, it would it would have struggled for resources. It would have struggled for focus. All the things that make big companies hard as an incubator. Right? Big companies tend not to be very good incubators. And that's why. Because you've got all this process and competition for resources and buy-in and all that stuff. Outfit enabled me to just jump create this new experience with a new team, new set of, you know, capital, uh, and, and run with it. So what is it? If I don't know outfit and I'm new to this show, I don't know what outfit is. Heck, I just got introduced to TRX because TD said, you got to use these black and yellow straps. And what is outfit? Like at a 10,000 foot macro level, what is it? Well, at a super macro level, it is outdoor group fitness, right? delivered through a tricked out, you know, F-350 Ford Transit van that, that is a world-class rolling gym that, believe it or not, you can trample 100 people at a time. Mm-hmm. That's how much gear is in these, but it's all functional, right? It's all functional training. We don't, you know, we don't have, we're not going to stock it with machines and Olympic, you know, lifting gear. That's, that's too much. And that lives in a gym, right? In a brick and mortar gym. What we're doing is outdoor functional style training, kettlebells, suspension trainers, you know, rip trainers, bands, balls, ropes, um, all the stuff that you would do if you set up one of your classes out in the parking lot, right? And and decided you were going to train your athletes out there, right? You're probably not hauling out all the stuff that you have from inside the studio. You're going out for a year and about died. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Anybody who's been doing that. From that, I've got PTSD. Actually, I call it PTCD now, post-traumatic COVID disorder. But uh, that's a whole nother story. Yeah. Well, no. And everybody, who, anybody who's listening who was doing that realizes number one how hard it was, and that, and that's not really what I wanted to do. I wanted to take the stuff that yep. TRX builds, take it out into parks, into cul-de-sacs, right? And so this this network, what will become at the moment we're only in South Florida because that's where we launched, what will become a nationwide network of these mobile gyms will all be controlled by a really state-of-the-art technology platform that kind of mashes together like the capabilities of say Uber, MindBody, and ClassPass, you know, kind of map mashed together into, so what I mean by that is geolocation, right? So you can put a, a vehicle on a piece of dirt at the same time that a whole you know, a bunch of cats show up to work out. Um, uh, mind body registration, billing, you know, um, all the stuff that you would normally do to reserve a spot in a in a class. And then it's all done under a subscription model like ClassPass, so that we're not caught up. I really wanted to help trainers. I mean, part of why I launched this was because I've watched so many trainers over the years struggle to build careers. You know, a lot, I mean, the, the standard trainer trainer career path looks a lot like a sharecropper a couple hundred years ago, right? Working on somebody else's farm and, you know, you toil sun up to sun down. And then at the end of a career, like, what, what do you have, right, to show for it? Unless you were one of the foolish few like you who went out and, and took all the risk to do a brick and mortar, which, you know, that can be a very binary outcome. Right. And, and maybe the worst outcome of all is the non-binary one where people barely get by for, yeah. for decades. Right. right. And so so I've watched all this and thought, you know, I think there's a model that I can create under a franchise business structure that has such low buy in, such low overhead. Right. Low fixed overhead, but such large revenue potential that people can come in who don't have a lot of money, get rolling with one open a second, open a third, and then eventually, you know, own three, six of these things that when they go to retire, they can start selling them off to the partners that they have running them and actually have created net worth. So that was part of my inspiration was like, I believe we can change the paradigm for trainers 
And um, and so that's what I'm trying to do. A couple of questions, Randy. And folks, I, I told you earlier, this is a conversation as if I'm sitting in the loft with Randy talking business here. Uh, I'm curious on outfit, uh, are the franchisees, is the idea that these are trainers, owners and operators, or are these non-trainers fit pros who want to get into the fitness business and are going to work with trainers to get three, four, five, six uh, multiple uh, locations? Well, I hope it's going to be both. I mean, I, I got to caveat all of this by saying, you know, we only launched in April, right? So, so we're in, we're in um, Fort Lauderdale and the, the South Florida area. We started with units that are company owned. We've already landed our first uh, area developer, which is an amazing guy. Guy ran a, a, a big group of Orange Theories and has basically come up his whole career in franchising. So, so the model is, I think, going to be both to answer your question. There will be some people that will be coming in as investors saying, hey, I want to I want to buy, you know, the rights to 20 for because I want to own a whole territory. Right. Um, or a whole marketplace. There will be others that will be coming in that are saying, hey, I'm a you know, I'm, I'm a coach. I'm a I'm a trainer, a fit pro by profession. And I want to buy one and I want to build it out as as my own. And then maybe add a second, maybe add a third. So I want it to be both. I want it to be a mix of both. I don't want to end up with, you know, we have 10,000 units. I don't necessarily want to have 10,000 partners um, because that's not a very, that's not a very efficient business, right? But I want to have lots of partners in that mix that have one, two, three, not just, you know, not just partners that have 30. And why would a trainer, coach, or entrepreneur want to partner with Outfit for saying, hey, Patrick has a brilliant idea. I'm going to go out and get myself a F 350, put a bunch of equipment in it, and show up at the local local park and and do my own exercise thing. Why would they partner with Outfit? Well, I mean, it's a good question, and it was one of the questions that I was asking myself when I started doing diligence around this concept. Was like I couldn't get my head around. All right, I've traveled all over, you know, all over the world, and. TRX and certified over 350,000 trainers, right? So a lot of those cats have worked out in boot camps. Yep. And I could never figure out, like, why has no one done in this space what, say, for instance, well, I'll give you another metaphor. So independent coffee shops, TD, been around a couple thousand years, right? Since the Greeks. Well, then along came Starbucks. And so how did that happen and why did it take so darn long? And I was asking myself this question, like, well, why is it that you, you see what appear to be some successful boot camps out there, but you never see one that's got more than like one, maybe two locations, right? And I think that I've now, I now understand the answer to that question because it's freaking hard. It, it's it's easy to, to find a space, and if you're really good and you work really hard, to create a following in that space, right? What is very challenging is then to figure out how to scale that. And, and I think that, you know, one big answer is you, it requires a very sophisticated technology platform to be able to do that. Um, but beyond that, you know, it, it kind of comes back to your question of, well, why do a franchise period versus, versus a tabla rosa startup, right? And by that, I mean just a whiteboard startup. Yep. Um, the answer is because presumably if the franchisee is any good, they're taking a lot of experience and a lot of best practices, putting them together in a system, creating all the playbooks, and then helping you basically it's business in a box so that the day you launch it, you get to be good at what you're good at, right? Which in, in this case is, is actual training. And it, it takes, as you know, a lot of time, energy, and dedication to become a good coach. And so very few people who are, are business people are very good at, you know, fitness coaches or, or athletic training uh, coaches. Similarly, very relatively few coaches are great business people. And, and so what I'm trying to do uh, with Outfit is to create really a business in a box where you bring your talents and not a lot of cash, right? That's the other beauty of this is we've worked out and we're, as we achieve scale, you know, our, our cost of buy-in will keep falling. But the, I think the risk of, of, of failure and the odds of success um, you know, the risks are minimized and the odds, I believe, um, are maximized by partnering.
thing with a franchise that, you know, has a lot of folks in it that have been doing this for a long time. And Randy, if someone wants more info on Outfit, where would they get that? Uh, outfittraining.com is our is our URL. And on that um, on that site, there is there there's both uh, a page for interest in folks that want to work at an outfit platform and there's folks uh, there's a page for franchise interest who want to want to own you know and, and buy into them so that's that's how you would do it and then you know my team would, would reach out and have a chat check that out because I, i've seen the videos of of randy and the team down there doing their thing and i i always love when i see hetrick in the trenches training and i see the team laughing smiling slamming med balls and uh, having a blast and changing lives especially now in this crazy time that uh you know, exercise and movement is cathartic. Speaking of cathartic and exercise, the industry overall is positioned uh, in, in a very precarious way right now. If you were to wave the magic wand, what is the future of fitness, Randy, in the next three years, do you say? Is it the hybrid model that so many people are talking about? Obviously, you have a new model outfit, which obviously you're, you're very, uh, you, you know, you believe in 100%, but is brick and mortar still going to be as, pertinent? Is it the online model that TRX uh, certainly has invested in? What is your prediction in the next few years of the fitness model? I, I think there's absolutely um, going to be a great place for the brick and mortars. I think that, you know, it's a challenging, I mean, it's been such a challenging time because nobody really understands fully what COVID is, isn't, will, or won't do. And that uncertainty, and God knows there's more than enough opinion on it, right? But that uncertainty is what keeps people from diving back into the gym. You know, you go into the gym and suddenly you notice there's a bunch of people huffing and puffing around you. And and even the, the, the most bullish and vaccinated among us still sort of has that, that mental sort of thought, wow, is this a good idea, right? And, and that that's just a reality of it that has to pass before things will, I, I think, get back to normal. That said, I don't know that they'll ever get fully back to normal normal if you define normal as what it was five years ago, right? I think that a lot of behavior has changed during the pandemic. Sure. People have become comfortable with this weird format that you and I are sitting here chatting on. And and I think that people have learned, oh, I actually do like having some outdoor fitness. I do like having some home fitness. I still love my guys at the gym, right? But but the 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 menu has gotten broader. And so I do think it's important for operators in, in the club space to acknowledge that and not not sort of be thinking, oh, it's gonna go away soon. Yeah. I'm not sure that's accurate, right? And I think you probably wanna have some of both as your options for your members. Mm -hmm. So good. So good. I'd love to get your feedback too, folks, uh, regardless of what your industry career is. Obviously, movement, movement is essential these days. We have to be moving our bodies. And whether that's indoors, outdoors, in a parking lot, uh, with outfit, with Fitness Quest 10, whatever studio gym uh, club you work out at, on online, virtual, let's keep moving our bodies. Matter of fact, Randy's wearing a shirt right now. He's listening and says, Make your body your machine. That's been the TRX monster since 2005, six when they got going. Uh, but we got to keep moving our bodies. It's medicinal. So let's continue to do that. I do want to switch gears. And uh, Randy, prior to you getting into the fitness industry and you had this bootstrap startup called TRX and, uh, and got going and took the world by storm, you served many years as a Navy SEAL. And I don't want to get into the politics of everything going on, but I do want to talk about an interesting scenario that I do, I'm very interested in. And I, I study it and think about, man, this world is in a precarious situation. I think of Afghanistan and the U.S. and, and all the people in the situation. As a Navy SEAL, we don't need to talk politics, but as a Navy SEAL, talk about the situation now where we've got thousands of well, number one, thousands of Americans over there in uh, Kabul. We also have a lot of Afghanis who uh, are are there now um, with the Taliban just taking rule. What's what's the mindset of Randy Hetrick, the Navy SEAL, and all the lessons that you've learned 
What would Randy Hedrick do right now if you were in charge? Man. Oh, folks, I just turned the script big time. Oh, yeah. To, to the uh, Navy SEALs and, and the Taliban. Let's go. Heck, man, I thought we were going to talk about push-ups. Uh, now you're going deep. You're going deep. Well, I mean, look, the, the good news is, uh, for me, as I've told you before, I'm sort of politically centrist, which as a military officer has great benefits because you have to work for both sides of the aisle, right? Um, or or as, as we used to say, but, you know, whatever, whoever the knucklehead is who's in charge, he's in charge. And so we would uh, have to support both parties. Um, and so I was temperamentally pretty well suited for that because I kind of sat right in the middle to begin with. Um, philosophically, and I've stayed that way. So I, I, I can't even give a political answer. And frankly, there's no, there really isn't one because if you think about this, it is a, it is truly a, a bipartisan war that we've had. It was launched by George Bush, a Republican, continued by Barack Obama, a Democrat, uh, taken over by Donald Trump, a Republican, and now, you know, is, is, uh, is finishing uh, with Joe Biden, a Democrat. So, you know, and all of them have talked about wanting to get in and get out. And, and so I don't, you know, I think that, that matters of great geopolitical um, significance like this tend to be these things that somebody ends up holding the hot potato, but it, but, you know, both sides of the aisle and both you know, the houses of uh, Congress have, have had to be involved in every decision that's been made. That said, there, there's no easy answer in these, you know, these situations. I mean, in my case, I was turning over command of uh, a squadron at the special missions unit two months before the whole thing started, right? And I was in business school when, you know, the planes hit, hit the uh, Twin Towers. So, I've watched the entire thing as an outsider, but who came from the epicenter of that universe only months before it kicked off. And, you know, one of my dear friends with whom I worked forever led the Bin Laden raid. Um, you know, I've had so many friends uh, deployed uh, for, for I mean, decades in this war, uh, lost a lot of good friends. Um, and I, I think that, you know, what's heartbreaking about it, and, and it is unfortunately just a lesson that the U.S. does not seem to learn, is that when you go into something like that, we went in with all of this, you know, solidarity because we, we'd been attacked on our homeland and there was a clearly defined enemy that was resident, you know, in, on the ground in Afghanistan, even though ironically they weren't even Afghanis, uh, you know, and we went in there and smashed the hell out of them, but then made the mistake of deciding to stay and become nation builders. And the challenge with that is that the United States is not temperamentally suited to be nation builders, right? The Brits were pretty good at it for, you know, five or 600 years because they had a benevolent dictatorship called a monarchy. So, you know, even though they had a, a um, parliamentary system, what the monarch wanted to do for a very long time was what got done. And, and so that kind of, of um, purposefulness and long standing rule is better for nation builders mm -hmm. because you're not, you're not sort of quite so um, susceptible to the vagaries of political changes in the wind, right? And what happens with us is that there's so much political cynicism that whoever's in charge, the other side sniping at them and using every every opportunity that comes up to try to advance their position vis-a-vis -vis the, the party in control. And so what happens is American politicians lose their nerve for you know deployments abroad. But once you're there, there's not really much to do about it. So what they do is they tend to with they tend to downsize and get just the minimum number of people on the ground there to sort of hold on to the status quo, which dooms the nation building effort to failure, right? It's and it's something that we really saw. I mean, it's almost a carbon copy in in many ways of the fall of Saigon. You know, we stuck around in Vietnam for way too long, right. incrementally drawing down. So you're not 
you know, you really almost need to do the opposite. If you're going to really nation build, you got to go in with the big foot and just stand on everyone for a generation or two until they age out and they just go, you know what? I want to have a nice car, you know, and a hot girlfriend and, you know, a nice house for my family. And like they're, you know, people are people. So that's, I think, TD, the challenge is that, that right now the Biden administration is, is chosen to kind of take the last step and draw down. And as you do, if you didn't do a good job nation building, then what is what you're seeing right now play out on, you know, on the news is what you get. You get chaos, you get a return to, you know, control of, of the, the gorillas that you were fighting all that time. And you end up with a lot of, of tragedy and heartbreak, you know, for all the people who believed that you were going to help change things and you were going to be there by their side. And it's just a, it's a terrible, terrible circumstance. And I, I can only imagine how my colleagues, you know, in arms feel in this moment where they fought for, you know, every yard of dirt over in that place and shed blood and lost comrades, right, and saw horrible things happen to the citizenry of, of Afghanistan for what? Right. That's the question you're left with. For what? You know, if you lost a, a 25, 30 year old son or husband or daughter, you're sitting here now going, what in the hell? Like, what what was that about? You know, and, and I, I really I, my heart breaks for those folks. Yeah, I scratch my head thinking as we send thousand troops back in there, it's probably going to get bloody again quick. And if you get out, then the Taliban takes over. They'll be on our soil real quick as it grows and grows and grows. So I'm not sure what the answer is, but. Yeah, it's, it's, there's no easy one. There's, there's no, I mean, because to, you know, you, you kind of see both sides of it, right? And, and it's like, yeah, we've been there all this time. But how long are we going to be there? And how many more Americans are we going to send in? And it really, I think, was probably very disheartening for my colleagues that are still in uniform to see the Afghan government just cut and run, right? right? The, the, the president leaves, the military, you know, throws their, throws their uniforms and weapons on the ground and goes back to their villages. Well, then what the hell are we doing there? I mean, if that's, if that's how they feel, right? <laughs> I don't want to send my kid over there who spends, you know, Harry spends more time than I would like, you know, musing over, over, geez, should I go do something like you did after I get out of college? And, you know, I, I'm sitting here as a guy who's, I mean, nobody's any more patriotic than, than I am, but I don't want that. You know, I don't want my kid being handled, handed to some bumbling politician who is cynical and just wants to get elected or reelected and is willing to deploy, you know, America's youth into conflict so that they can pound their chest and act like tough guys. Yeah, I don't want that for my kid. So it's kind of, I don't, I don't, I don't know the answer. There's, there's, there's no good one other than uh, hopefully the Taliban will become so overwrought with the delights of running their own government that, that it will sort of, they will be so occupied with that mess, right. And trying to be an administrator that they won't have any energy to come mess with anybody else. Hey, interesting, interesting insight there, Randy. I, I appreciate that. And again, it's not, it's not an area I've dressed on the show before, but one that I value your opinion uh, as a former SEAL and the amazing decisions that need to be made from our leaders, our nation's leaders. And I do know this, folks, is that we need to pray for our leaders. We need to pray for those men and women who are serving, whether they are being deployed back over that way or their support or they're here on our own soil. Um, we are in precarious times and certainly we need to stay in prayer during this time as well. Um, so Randy, thank you for your insight on that. I yeah, Todd, can I have one thought? Like one thing I wish we could do, because I'm old enough to remember back in the day when, when this did happen, is I wish we could stop rooting against each other in our political, and maybe as a centrist, I see it more clearly than others because, you know, I see it in both directions, but I, I really wish we could figure out how to 
how to become a better version of the United States of America, because we live in this environment now that is fed by media, social media, the ubiquity of, of, of specious information, right? And and we seem to have found ourselves in this place where we're constantly rooting against the other guy. And what that means is you're actually rooting against your country because whoever's in charge is has, for better or worse, has the wheel, right? And so by rooting against that party, you're effectively undermining, you know, the success of, of the country and you're putting, you know, in the case of military ventures, you're putting servicemen and women in jeopardy. And it's just, but all across the country, I, I it's just something that I constantly am scratching my head about and ask, how did this happen? You know? Isn't that going to take a unique leader, a unique leader who is exactly what you're talking about, is not necessarily a devout Republican or Democrat and sticking to it because of the political gains, but truly as a humanitarian, as someone who, who values life and and even government and state, but I think it's going to take a unique leader. This is what I pray for, that there's some young man or woman right now, or, or maybe it's an old cat, right? Maybe, maybe it's you or me, Randy. <laughs> That's not me, man. I'm too, I'm too old to take that one on, right? I'm <laughs> Trust me, I... I, I I, man, this is going deep, but there, there are times when I think, man, is this something that like I cut, I'd be cut out to do? Is this someone who, who is it going to be? It's going to take someone. I believe this is my own personal thing that is going to lead this country in a way that's never been led before. It's going to be. It's gonna, I, I, I agree. I, I think it's going to be a uniter. I mean, that is the, the dominant theme that we need is somebody who you know, isn't so deeply beholden to a party that he or she cannot see the greater good, right? And and understand that that democracies that democracies are built on frustrating compromise. Because that is the reality. That is how this this you know institution was created. It was on the basis of horse trading and nobody gets exactly what they want so that everybody gets most of what they want. Right. Like that's it's, it's such a simple concept, but it's not easy to to affect. And I, you know, I, I kept hoping that my good friend who I worked for many times over the years, Bill, Bill McRaven, mm-hmm. Admiral Bill McRaven, yeah. you know, very centrist character, incredible character. Uh, one of the smartest guys that I, I ever had the, the, the privilege to work with. I kept hoping he was going to throw his hat in because I believe he's one of those kinds of uniters. Um, I think it may ultimately take a, a woman to to be to be honest. I think that that I've seen a lot of great characteristics in female leaders that sometimes us testosterone filled Cro-Magnon mother scratchers just cannot <laughs> find it in ourselves to to. Here. This is crazy. This is I'm telling you, I I think it may I take a female who has more of a you know a communal builder approach which i do believe women are are you know smarter and more uniquely qualified to unite sometimes than guys i think guys tend to be more um, combative by nature you know we kind of came up through the evolutionary uh uh line as protectors and and um i think it may take a a a female leader to kind of reset us and uh, now I hope she comes along. Me as well. Every time I think about running for, for office, Randy, I know I'm going to lose because the one thing I would do in, in office, I'd make exercise mandatory for everybody. So therefore, I would lose. <laughs> a large portion of the, of the population does not exercise move, but I'd make it mandatory in schools, mandatory PE from kindergarten through 12th grade. Uh, and adults would need to, we would need to uh, get our minds right by getting our bodies right. So. But you'd have my vote. You'd have my vote because it'd be easier for me to find time to work out if that were the mandate. <laughs> oh, man. Well, that's an interesting insight. And let me ask you this. As a Navy SEAL and the lessons you've learned, everyone listening in right now, while they may have views on this situation, let's step back. Everyone's going through some form of adversity. If you were to take one or two lessons macro as a Navy SEAL getting through adversity, what would you say 
today how one gets through adversity. Now, I, I, I preface it with this. Whenever you are on a mission, whenever a Navy SEAL or the military is on a mission, it rarely goes exactly as planned. So sometimes we believe we have a plan on how we get through something. What would you say today? Whatever it is, when one's health isn't where they want it, one's mindset, we talk about mental health all the time, uh, one's mindset or mental health isn't where we want it, one's career, one's relationship, what would you say would be a couple of lessons one could get to say, this is how I'm going to navigate these waters today? Well, there's a, there's a famous saying, a military adage that, that no plan survives the first contact. Right, which which I really think is true. I mean, you know, the the plan may 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 carry through in large part, but there are going to be modifications that get made by by what you see in reality when you you know when you move forward, and that's kind of where we've been. It's it's like you know this is an adverse climate. Um, it's challenging emotionally. You know, I find myself in I have been trying to describe this lately to, to friends, like in a weird vertigo. It's kind of this, you're not, I'm not totally off kilter, but neither am I really firmly rooted. I, I feel like there's so much ambiguity that it's hard to, it's hard to not feel anxious, right? That's something that I think I just want to share because, because it's, you know, you know, I think everybody you know. feels it and, and not a lot of people talk about it <laughs> because it's, I don't know, it makes you seem vulnerable or whatever, but I feel it. I feel, you know, like I'm constantly trying to reset myself and reground, develop new habits that, because my productivity feels like it's scattered. And, um, and so, you know, I, I would just drop that, offer that as a backdrop that it's okay if you're feeling that. I, you certainly are not alone. I would, in fact, say you are in the majority because. I don't know anybody who, who doesn't tell me that, yeah, man, I, I just, it feels a little scary and, and nervous and, you know, that's sort of how it is. And so one of the things I would tell you, one of the tools that I, that I learned uh, as a SEAL is that, you know, the art of compartmentalization, it, it, it's, it's a double-edged sword. It works real well in work environments. But then you got to go and spend a bunch of time in therapy to undo it for your relationships, right? So, so, <laughs> so it's like, what, here's what I mean by that. You know, in the SEAL teams, you learn, you have to learn how to take fear, kind of objectify it, right? Um, kind of put some boundaries around it, and then apply a set of procedures called, you know, standard operating procedures, your SOPs that really um, are designed to address that circumstance that caused the fear. And so by having, you know, a set of standard operating procedures, you're able to put that fear in a box, not, not throw it away, but you're able to kind of, I used to have this mental storage zone under my armpit. I would just take it and I'd tuck it under my armpit, right? And that would help me let go of it and focus on the task at hand. And I find myself doing that a lot now right it's you know it's it's really about the, the big the big lesson is about hey focus on controlling the things you can control right and doing everything you can to to deliver the outcome that you desire with those things you can control while at the same time acknowledging i can't control everything so so that i just kind of have to let go of at some level right and not i mean I, look i don't control vac vaccination policy so me spending all this, all these cycles and energies and mental mojo and emotional mojo worried about what's going to happen with vaccines is counterproductive. I cannot affect it. And so I, without meaning to sound cavalier, I just sort of push that stuff aside and go, all right, I can't control that. So I'm going to focus on the things that I can control. Right. And, and that to me, that ability to compartmentalize fear and anxiety uh, and, and not, not, not disavow it, not act like it's like, it's not valid, but just say like, I can't control that right now. I'm going to set that aside. I'm going to focus on what I control that, that helps me. And it's a lesson that I learned in the teams because obviously you do things 
I mean, hell, during peacetime, you're doing things 300 days a year that can kill you if something goes wrong. And so you have to focus not on the fear of death. You have to focus on the SOPs that prevent something from going wrong. Right. You, you understand that, like that distinction that I'm talking about? It's like the fear is there because, man, you fail to, to clear a bad parachute. There's a bad outcome headed your way shortly. So like the fear is real, but that can't stop you from going out the back of an airplane and doing your, your job. Right. So you have to then focus on the procedures, the safety procedures, all the check downs that you do with your buddy. Right. And make sure that every step that when you were packing that chute, you didn't cut corners. Right. You didn't do it when you were hung over or tired. Right. Like you, 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 or if you were, you focus extra and take extra time to pack that parachute. Right. Because, because that's the things that, that I could control. So once I got done with packing that parachute perfectly, if I wasn't 100% sure of it, I'd open the damn thing up and do it again because, all right, so that took me an extra 30 minutes. My life's worth that, right? And then and then giving my partner the absolute best check down that I could possibly, you know, effect in exchange for him doing the same for me. And then, all right, at that moment, hey, every fiber in your being as you're getting ready to go out of an L. Out of, a, out of an airplane at 30,000 feet in the black and night, loaded up with gear like a little Volkswagen rolling out the side. Every sense in your body is telling you, don't do it, stop, right? Like, but your brain can sort of go, no, I'm good. I'm good because I did. I, I checked one through 40, three times, right? Not once, not twice, three times. And I know that I'm going to be okay. And then you, you clear your mind and you go forward. Wow. wow. Take a breath on that one, folks. That's, that's a, that's a great, great thought process there by, by Randy. I want to step back and say, you talk about ambiguity and how most people, at, le at least I'll say most people these days feel that. I saw a quote a while back, I forget who it was attributed to, but it said, ambiguity is the enemy of people. Ambiguity is the enemy of execution. Meaning, if you feel, feel mm -hmm. kind of lost, can't execute anything because you, you you don't know where to go. And I'm curious, how are you dealing with that now? If if there's this, and I and I hear you and feel you on this, when you feel ambiguity, what do you do on a regular basis to help get you clear it's about controlling the controllables? What are some things that you're doing to to have more clarity of purpose on a daily basis so you don't feel that ambiguity? Well, the ambiguity is there. Um, it's real because, again, back to the things you don't control, right? Like, I don't control the economy. I don't, there's a lot I can't control. But um, there's another another lesson that I learned in the teams that I find that I think is a really good way to answer this question. You know, when you're doing land navigation, back particularly in the old days, pre pre uh, you know, satellite uh, nav systems, right? Pre GPS, it was all map and compass. And, you know, it's pretty easy to get lost when you're out there. And it's scary when you get lost, like really freaking scary because now you're lost and you don't even, you don't know where to go, which direction to charge in, you know? And so one of the, one of the earliest lessons that I learned, it's funny, I was just talking about this the other day, was this idea of when you're lost, don't just charge forward and think you're going to somehow miraculously get found because oftentimes that gets you deeper into being lost mm. and instead stop, turn around, find your way back to your last known point where you felt secure and you felt found. Right. And then sort of take a minute there, reset, remap out your surroundings and then proceed forward on your course. Right. So it's just this idea of whenever, and I use this, I mean, obviously I'm not doing a lot of land nav these days, right? So, but I use this metaphor in, in my life as a business, as an entrepreneur and as a, as a business leader, it's easy to get lost. And with all this ambiguity, you know, it's, it's easy to, it's very hard to keep a prioritization like you would have in, in days gone by. And so there's a lot of opportunity to kind of feel lost at 
Jesus, what, you know, what are we doing? Where am I going? What matters? What doesn't matter? What's going to, you know, what, what are even, what, what does success even look like? You know, it, it's easy to lose all of that in this cloud of uncertainty. And so I do think it's helpful to step back and go, all right, let me go back to where I last felt found, where I really knew where, where, where I was, where we were as an organization, what was working for us, you know, what were our challenges that, that we were trying to surmount, and just kind of reground in that comfort of being back on terra firma, right? Back where you kind of, all right, yeah, I now remember where we were. I know what was working. And then take a look forward into the clouds and say, all right, so where do I want to go now? Not, not over the journey of the next 10 years. Where do I want to go over the next 10 meters of trail, right? And then, and then at the end of that 10 meters, do it again. And, and suddenly, you know, I, I found, I mean, that's honestly, that's one of the things that led me to outfit because I was, you know, I, I, I won't lie, I was struggling, even though the decision was mine largely mine i i was struggling with this idea of handing over the reins of my baby that i've been building and growing you know with every fiber of my being for 18 years handing that over to somebody else that you know i don't know that they're going to be better than me i'm hoping but hope's not a course of action i don't know they're going to be any better and so i was really struggling with that and one of the you know one of the things that i did as I stepped back and I said, well, you know what? Like, I'm a builder. I like building new things. That's what turns me on. It's why I'm a pretty good product designer, right? I like finding problems and then MacGyvering a solution and then figuring out, you know, sampling that out there to see if I'm nuts or if other people think it's, it's a good solution. And if it is, then building a little team around it. You know, that whole process makes me happy. And so... Part of part of my going back to my last known point was, you know, I was not I was not feeling very good about this decision uh, that I had already sort of put the balls in motion on, right? And rather than go smash the balls and you know draw it all all back in in pieces, I decided, nope, what makes me happy? Building makes me happy, right? And and I got a new direction, and really it's kind of helped carry me through a lot of this mayhem that's been swirling around all of us over the last, you know, 18 to 24 months. Folks, take a deep breath in right now, because as you breathe in nice and deep, you just heard tremendous wisdom and Randy giving you permission to actually step back. Why? Because how many times do you step back and you feel guilty that you're not moving forward? Right? You, you feel like we always have to be moving forward. We always have to be making quote progress. And you step back and you feel guilty like, I'm, I'm going in reverse, going backwards. Randy just said there that actually it's a great course of action going back to the SEAL teams that uh, stepping back into that familiar land point prior to where you're at now actually allows you to see the world clearer. That's tremendous wisdom, Randy, when you think about that is it's okay to step back. It's okay. Don't feel guilty about taking a step or two backwards to get that clarity that we all want to see where we're heck going forward. Two more questions for you, Randy. Today, in wearing many hats, what's the hardest thing that you do? You've got TRX, you've got outfit, you've got, you know, all these, these things going on that you're trying to quote figure out, you're stepping back. What is the hardest thing that you do overall? Well, pro I mean, it's probably dealing with the ambiguity of the outcomes, you know, I, I think, honestly, because that's a good question. I mean, I, I think part of being a startup guy is you get used to doing a lot of hard stuff. That's just part of the deal. But, but a lot of it is hard and inspiring, right? Hard and inspiring is always okay to me. Like people ask about buds. Oh my God, wasn't that, I've never done anything more inspiring than going through buds. So was it hard? Yeah, but it was so inspiring that it didn't matter. You know, it didn't matter at all. It's like, it's, it's the entrepreneur's credo. My, my, uh, my granddad told me, I love this, this old saying, that, Randy, always work for yourself. Even if it means you have to work for an asshole, which, <laughs> which 
which I I always thought that was pretty that was pretty insightful, right? Because because what it what it basically said was like, look, if you're working for yourself, the work is not the same kind of work, right? Right. As if you're working for somebody else who is, for instance, an a-hole. Working for yourself, you can put up with, and and, and a big part of that is because it's, it's hard, but it's inspiring. Right? You're making progress. The mistakes you make are yours. Um, and and so I think that um, that the hard stuff is the stuff that the really hard stuff is the stuff that is hard but not inspiring. And I think ambiguity falls in that category, right? Like, yep. like it's just hard. It's hard not knowing what's coming our way. It's not very inspiring. You got to try really hard to turn that into, you know, make lemonade out of lemons by saying, well, yeah, but think of all the opportunities that are opened up. And that's true. But it's hard to remember that when you're feeling anxious and a little scared and, you know, and you don't know your long term future and how your family going to be healthy. That's, that's probably the hardest, hardest thing that any of us deal with right these days. Right. Anybody who doesn't have a disease because you want hard. That's hard. Right. That's hard. And and uh, and for the rest of us, it's all. It's all between our ears. And I try to remind myself, CD, of this on the regular, that like all these anxieties and this angst, really for most of us, it happens between our own ears, right? Because even if we're struggling, most of us aren't worried about where our next meal is coming from. Most of us maybe aren't even worried about making our, our mortgage or our rent, right? But we still, we feel scared and we let ourselves get crazy with all this anxiety and it is hard to remember but i do encourage folks to try to remember that you know what this this stuff is all man-made and i'm the man who's making it. i got a book you can read by the way <laughs> you know what i'm waiting for my autographed copy of that thing <laughs> no seriously you know what i feel a sense of peace just in you saying that because i'm like oh gosh he gets it he, I, I, that's where i'm at and you're probably listening in thinking the same thing, like, yeah, I feel that same, that same angst that Randy is describing. And just knowing that there are other people in that situation is comforting to know that, hey, I'm not the only one. And you hear that with like even PTSD and I, again, yeah. I call it PTCD, uh, but in this very precarious time that we're in, to hear you, Randy, say that, like, good, I'm glad that he gets it because now we can talk more about that or others can talk about that. Folks, if you're understanding that, please, I want to know, are you feeling those same types of things these days? Like it could be minuscule or it could be really, really big, but that's normal. And that's a sign of the times. And uh, when we get to our best habit, we talk about those things uh, every, uh, every day here on the show. Uh, that's why we have to dial into to our best practices. My last question, Randy, in knowing you for over 15 years on so many different levels as a great friend and someone I would turn to in the best of times and the worst of times, uh, I know you're always searching for the best. You're the eternal optimist and you're a hard worker. What's bringing Randy Hetrick the most joy these days? What's bringing you the most happiness and fulfillment out of all the different hats and roles that you wear? Where are you finding the most joy? No, I, I mean, I find... I think that's an interesting question. I probably need to think more about joy, right? Because, because uh, you know, Marie Kondo uh, talks about sparking joy in uh, in what's her, what's her show? I can't remember what it's called, but it's a, I like that I like that idea of sparking your own joy. And I probably don't think enough about it. I I think really the stuff that that makes me the happiest comes from two sources. One of my boys, which I know you appreciate, right? Because I mean, I spend, you know, all the spare time that I, that I have and then some trying to, you know, raise my boys. And I, I'm, you know, fortunate to have bookends, right? I had, I had one, one that, you know, the, the first conflict, first real conflict I had was between, you know, the, the, the first day of college for Harry and the first day of kindergarten for Hawk. And if you don't find some irony, ironic humor in that, you got no sense of humor. Because uh, all I can do is laugh about it. But so so I, I get to see these unique perspectives every single day, right? Of this, this one big dude that's really got some big wings. He's starting to flap and he's out of the nest and 
he's you know about to be a junior at USC. And I got this other little dude who's just starting to figure it out and is starting to succeed in sports. And I feel very, very fortunate. Um, you know, that certainly has had its challenges, but I feel very fortunate that I get to do that again because I loved it so much the first time, man. And you're experiencing this now as they go out, right? It's like, oh my goodness, how do I live without weekend sports? How do I live without, you know, that rush that you get from your kids' delight every weekend? Right. And so, so that's a big source for me. And then the other source professionally is, as I said, just building, you know, every, every week, you know, outfit gets a little stronger, gets a little bigger, stands up a little taller. And I would, I would describe it as, as being like a, like a one-year-old, you know, it's, it's certainly not, it's certainly not walking, you know, flat and stable yet, but it's starting to spend more time on its feet than on its butt. Right. And, and, and that, that, that 13, 14 month period for most kids, right. Where they're, where, where they, they're still taking tumbles, but they sort of are rubber and nothing breaks. And then, but they're spending more time on their feet than on their butt. And that's, that's how I would describe outfit right now. And that gives me a lot of delight, right? It's like raising another kid and watching my, my teammates, many of whom are young, you know, succeed and flap their wings for the first time, getting to have, you know, some, some real responsibilities in their professional life. And uh, so, you know, those are kind of the two sources for me. I'd like to hear you. I want to know what you what, what's giving you joy right now. I'm going, to, I'm going to reveal that in a second, but I have to comment on this. The other day, you posted something on Instagram that made me laugh so hard. Folks, go to Randy's Instagram, uh, which had Randy Hetrick, I believe, right? And he, he took an, a, a video of his son's college fraternity room. And this place looked like a disaster. And Randy was just scanning it and showing everything about the room. And I was thinking about, I was cracking up laughing, thinking, oh my gosh, Luke or Brady would kill me if I showed the room like this. Well, well it wasn't, I wanted, I do want to be clear. That's, that, that's the room Harry's moving into, moving into, right? So I was down there to help him move into it after these two blockheads that were in the room before him had lived there all summer. I guess they had internships and man, I, you know, I mean, come on. 20 year old, 20 year old boys are a disgusting crew just, just by nature. Oh, I, it made me laugh so much. Uh, you know, to answer that question, I, it's definitely the kids. It's the family time I get now. Um, watching McKenna, uh, she's 13 on a soccer field. When I'm on a sideline on a weekend, we had four games this past weekend. I just, nothing else matters. I'm just totally immersed in watching her play and move and, I love it. It's pure joy. I'm next to Melanie and we're, we're talking about life. And then Brady, exact opposite of McKenna's joy. And I'm relaxed. Friday night lights is on. Brady's a linebacker slash DN lighting kids up. And, you know, frankly, Brady just likes to look good and hit people. <laughs> like he's not Luke. <laughs> he was a cerebral quarterback and, and that. And Brady on Friday nights, I just love the intensity that I'm out there and I'm, I'm on the sideline. I'm a quarterback's coach and, and I'm loving, you know, what, you know, watch Brady on defense and, and coach, coach the offense over there. But I, it brings me joy to work with these kids in, in a way that um, I don't know. My heart is just completely full. It's like, what would you do if money wasn't an issue? What would you do? I'd like, I would just coach my kids and, and love everything about it because it's, yeah. it brings me so much joy so good right it's so good and that i i mean honestly when when harry went off to college it, it was heartbreaking yes. to me and i and i you know that's back to that compartmentalizing you know i had compartmentalized the idea that he would ever go anywhere until it was right in front of me and then it was just crushing it was soul crushing to me because as excited as i was for him to go have that adventure it was like the end of an era and then i remembered Ooh, wait I get to do it again. And that just filled me up, you know? I've got to admit, Melly and I have been lost creatures uh, the last month since Luke has left. It, it, it wasn't the drop-off that was hard. It was after the fact. And now we feel lost. By walking in circles, where is Luke? And every time I come back to that, I keep coming back to her gratitude, and I've talked about this before. But knowing that he's in a place uh, in college where he's growing and maturing the way he needs to brings me joy, but 
personally, selfishly, I'm lost. It's terrible, isn't it? Thanks. It's horrible. So to your point, I love watching McCann. I love watching Brady. Luke is, I'm, I'm lost when it comes to that. Knowing I laugh all the time, like we feel like we're going through a breakup. <laughs> like it's where's, where's our oldest son? But ultimately, it is about joy and finding that. And I think it, it, the last, the last couple of years have certainly made what's most important more poignant. And even though feeling some of the ambiguity that you talk about, what can we focus our time and energy on? so that it brings us the most fulfillment at the end of the day when all this is up because i can't imagine the day for you when hawk is all grown up and out of the out of the nest or for me when mckenna is out of the nest it, it's a totally different well maybe by the time hawkins is out is out i'll be okay because i'll be so old i'll be caning my way down the sidelines on his, on his, uh, his games and i'll be like oh i just need to go lay down but uh but but for for now I'm so thrilled that that I get to experience that ride and for you you know you get you get to enjoy it all the way through McKenna and man she is such a stud she's so beautiful so talented I mean I just I I, I get excited looking at your posts and and I you know I think that that for folks that have kids uh, you have to enjoy that while while it lasts and really focus on it because I don't feel um, you know. As much time as I spent with Harrison, I still I still wish I'd spent more. 100%. You know, it's it's just the way it is. And when off they go, well, you can do better in the future, right? But you can't do better in the past. So if you got if you got little kids now, I would say you gotta really prioritize those minutes because the dollars, hey, the dollars are gonna come or they're not. Like you've got time to make dollars. You don't have time to waste with your kids. Mm -hmm. Randy Hetrick, man, it is so good to talk to you and catch up with you and share this episode uh, with all of my friends here. Uh, I believe this may be, out of 200 and something episodes, probably the longest one. That I've <laughs> but you can edit us down, TD. You can I'm not going to edit it. Why? Because, and I, I truly mean this, brother, and you know this, is uh, someone that I have always uh, loved being around and, and uh, as, as someone who I consider one of my best friends, the wisdom that you shared today and talking about all things from TRX to outfit to, man, Afghanistan and Navy SEAL lessons to parenting <laughs> and family. Uh, I so appreciate your time and your lessons. I know there have been people who have been served today and, and made better men and women because of your words. Well, hey, brother, I, I'm, you know, I, I got nothing but time and love for, for Todd Durkin. So I, I love what you're about. I love what you're doing. I mean, these podcasts, frankly, I think are great because, you know, they, they do something for people that, you know, that they, everybody needs perspective. And most of the time when we get sad or we get scared or, or, you know, bad things start to take over it's because we've lost perspective and sometimes just hearing you know from other people makes you kind of go "Ooh, all right you know that's right I, I i'm okay i'm doing all right and i think that what you do you know every day is to help is is to bring that that inspiration and that perspective to people so i appreciate you i appreciate what you do randy where can uh anyone follow you social media Personally, professionally, where's the best way people can uh, hang with Randy Hedrick? Well, if you like to see my uh, the, the antics of me and my and my kids uh, and and you know some weird other weird stuff, you can follow me at, at Randy Hetrick on uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever. Um, uh, please realize that I I do have people that help me get back to folks. So sometimes if I'm running a little late on my responses, it's not personal. Uh, it's just triage. And then, uh, you, you know, obviously TRX at TRX training, trxtraining.com. And then uh, outfit is at outfit training uh, and outfittraining.com. And those, uh, there's a lot of fun, cool stuff going on with outfit. So definitely give it a look if you haven't. I know for all, so many folks who follow you are those training pros that are out there in the world. And, you know, I do believe we're going to create something special here that that really is tailor-made 
for uh, my friends who make their living bringing health and fitness to the world. Listen, I'll give you a trainer, coach, or you're just a fitness enthusiast, weekend warrior, mind right maniac, fire breathing dragon who loves life. Follow Randy, follow Outfit, follow TRX. I promise you, uh, you're going to get a lot of great value in there. Randy, I'm going to end today's show not the way I normally do. If you can break this down with, with any, any parting words and then your signature statement that's on your shirt, and then that's a wrap. Randy, bring us home. <laughs> oh, man. Well, all right. My only, my, the, the, one thing, the one thing that has never failed me throughout my life is this one adage, which is never, never, never give up, right? And that was Winston Churchill in the depths of World War II. Just never quit. And uh, beyond that, get out. Get fit and make your body cheese. Wow. Oh, wow. Was that awesome or what? To catch up with Randy Hedrick today and discuss so many different things uh, when it comes to literally business and life and family and all that's going on, I just value Randy's wisdom his energy his time so much i hope you enjoy that as much as me when you think about randy as a navy seal and you hear how he approaches business now as a builder right? he, he's a builder and he talked about that i found such great value in that i would love to know from you which was your favorite part out of all the different aspects that we connected on with trx and how he built that from nothing to over 100 million dollars in sales and now to his latest venture outfit and what he's doing now as a startup once again in uh, in that project, what he's going to do and sharing his vision and how he believes that's going to create amazing impact to all of those who use the outfit model, found that tremendously inspiring. And of course, I, I never speak politics here on the show, but I really wanted to know his insight and his thoughts on the situation over in Afghanistan and and as a leader, how do we get through this time with all that's going on in this crazy world? And love his thought process on what we could do to continue to navigate these stormy waters that we're in. And then lastly, of course, when it comes to just where he's at now in life and what's bringing him the most joy, but also where he's struggling. And when he talked about ambiguity and feeling this, this sense of just slight angst. I think so many people can relate to that, resonate with that. I know myself is thinking, yeah, wait, that's interesting the way he said that. Yes, I can resonate and, and relate to that as well. So my friends, I hope you thoroughly enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. Uh, Randy's one of my best friends, and I, I can't believe that this is the first time I had, on, had him on exclusively because he's been on part of a show, uh, one of our, our first episodes way back when we started the podcast, but now we went... OT and then some, but let me tell you what, he certainly brought the heat today. So I hope you enjoyed that. Don't forget, as always, give us a five-star rating, write a review. It really helps uh, the show when you give us a five-star rating and write a review on iTunes, Apple, and uh, please share this episode. Share this episode and let them know of the conversation. And maybe you had to watch it over a two or three different times of your day or your week, and maybe you are going to listen to this over and over two or three times just because of what was shared in that. I just want to say thank you. I'm grateful for you. And until next time, remember, you do need to train hard, eat right, live inspired, and go create impact. Hey there, Sean Lake here with Bubs Naturals. And I thank you for listening to the Impact Hour. Listen, we have a special code for you as a listener. Use code IMPACT at checkout for all your Bubs Naturals product. You get 20% off the world's best collagen protein, your new favorite non-dairy creamer, our MCT oil powder. That's 20% off all pur purchases at bubsnaturals.com.